the Church of the East is known of, of an Antiochian tradition. What is an Antiochian tradition? There is two schools of thought. There's two schools of exegesis um, of the Old and New Testament. One, we call it the Alexandrian school, and the other we call the Antiochian school. The Alexandrian, which is the Egyptian one, which is the Coptic, currently the Coptic church, and the Antiochian, mainly, it is the Catholic church, the Orthodox church, us, uh, the Malachi church, the Maronite church, they are mainly Antiochian tradition, and I'll discuss the, uh, these two schools in, in details because it's important for you to know. The controversy of the 5th century, which is known as the Nestorian controversy, you've heard the, the title or the term Nestorian which uh, deals with the person of Nestorius, the patriarch of Constantinople, who was uh, condemned by the Synod of Ephesus. We'll discuss that later again. The controversy it was between Antioch and Alexandria. The, this controversy has really indeed touched the heart of the Christian church and shaking that tranquility uh, prevailed after the Arian controversy. Now, some of you, I would suggest uh, that if you've got a pen and pad, just write some of these terms that I'm using so you can look at them at the, on Uncle Google it'll help you out because, for instance, when I'm talking about the Aryan controversy, at least you know what happened, what's all about. Anyway, the Aryan controversy says that Christ is, a, is created. He's God, but he's created like any other human being. Anyway, the, that controversy, that, uh, philosophy or that teaching was condemned by the church. None of the heresies faced by the early church persisted or spread its harm as much as the Nestorian controversy. The dis dispute started between Antioch and Alexandria, two of the most important philosophical and theological Christian centers of the early church and homes of many known church father, fathers. The intensity, intensity of the dispute between them resulted in, the, in condemnation and retaliatory anathemas forming a new reality that touched the core of the Christian theology. Alexandria anathemized, uh, well, do you know what the meaning of the word anathema? Okay, you don't. Anathema, it means condemnation of being heretic, heresy. It means a person who's, who's receiving anathema from the church, he's alive, but he's dead. He should not be buried among Christians. He should not be... Um, greeted. He should not be received. So it's like completely um, the person would be better dead in the eyes of the church. So you can either look at, even look at that uh, term anathema, which is, it's a Greek uh, term. It shaped a new Christological understanding of the person of Christ. Leading heresies such Arianism, Gnosticism, you've heard, at least you heard of Gnostic. If not, please look into that one. Uh, they believed in two gods, uh, material gods, good and evil. 
these, these uh, controversies, the Arianism, Gnosticism, affected the early church in the West and the East too, but were not able to alter the foundation and principle of the, er, principles of the early church, which were solidified by the decrees of the Nicene Synod in 325 AD. Have you heard of the Nicene Synod? Okay, the Nicene Synod, which in, when we finish, we will read the Nicene Creed at the end here. You have it here at the end. This was a product of the Nicene Synod, the gathering of all bishops around the world, east and west, when Emperor Constantine called for that synod, for that meeting in, uh, uh, in Nicene. The synod said the foundation of our understanding of the person of Christ and declared that there is this, is, this is the main declaration at the synod. There is one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages. Now remember, the, they used the word begotten of the Father. They did not use born because Arianism taught that. But it was with the Father, begotten with the Father at all times, before all ages, Christ was there. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made. So they added the word not made in order to attack Arianism and Gnosticism and others of the same essence as the Father. Now, the church in the East, our church in the East, which was under the Persian rule, was unable to fully participate in this synod. Why? Because of the political tensions between the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire. And continuous wars between both powers. However, imagine, look at this, this is very important. It was almost after 35 years after the synod called of Nicaea, after that synod, 35 years later, we were able to adopt the Nicaean Creed in our church uh, liturgy when Mar Ishaq, the patriarch Mar Ishaq, in, in 410 AD, the Persian allowed the Church of the East to gather its bishop and have a synod in the East. That was the first synod that the Church could publicly call, and it was called in Seleucia Ctesiphon in 410. Seleucia Ctesiphon currently is Baghdad. It was the capital city of the Perthians of the Persian Empire. That creed was officially adopted and sanctioned by the church within the Persian Empire. Now, the Synod of Nicaea was considered a milestone in the development of a well-defined understanding of the person of Jesus Christ. Now, the church, the early church, believed, yes, Christ is God, but they couldn't understand how, in what shape, what form, what philosophy, what theology, what Christology. Because the, the early church, the apostles, were not, they did not busy themselves with the issue of Christology. It, they were just spreading the good news of the salvation of the kingdom of heaven. So they were not interested in all these philosophical issues that the Greek came up later with, we'll, we'll discuss. So it was a, a shallow faith that everybody believed that Christ was God incarnate and he died on the cross and after three days 
He arose from the dead, and he came for, and he will come again for the judgment of the world, and he died for our sins. That was a simple Christian message. And even they did not discuss the, the role, his role in the salvific journey as the incarnate Son of God, the Father, and his great plan for the redemption of humanity. His will, his ultimate promise to, my, to mankind of the inheritance of his, his kingdom. Nevertheless, the synod did not delve into Christological uh, details or specific interpretation of the person of Jesus Christ. There was no interpretation. They just said Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He is God incarnate. Not even other than this understanding. Christ is fully God and fully man of the same essence as the Father. They did not go into the details. This is at the Nicene Synod. The matter in question remained with how Christians can fully comprehend the doctrine of incarnation. You know what incarnation is, right? Good. In a world Unindated by different philosophical interpretations, comprehensions of the divine nature, matter, ethics, metaphysics, and the nature of things. Based on their philosophical background and the school of thought they belong to, this reality has led some to further explain philosophically and logically the doctrine of incarnation and distinctiveness of the person of Christ his divine and human natures, also the role and attributes of the Virgin Mary, the understanding of the divine conception, the hypostatic, pneume, parsupa, uh, kiane, union, and other concept, concepts. Now, all this, as I said, early Christianity was very simple. But as soon as Christianity went into the Roman Empire, where the Greek philosophical thinking, Plato, Aristotle, and all these schools of thought were there, they took Christianity and they started dissecting it. Typical, typical Greeks, typical philosophical interpretation. So they wanted to know, what do you mean by uh, fully man, fully God? What do you mean by... His nature is divine. His nature is human. What do you, what do you mean by uh, Mary, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the conception, the miraculous conception of Christ, uh, of Mary? What is all this, the incarnation? So they started taking these words one by one and explaining it explaining it philosophically, and imagine what Greeks will do with these. Just reading Plato, it's not easy. Praying, reading Aristotle is not easy. So now, these schools, the Greek, the Romans, the Alexandrians, the Antiochian, they will pick up this Christianity, and now they sit home, and they start searching and examining every single word in Christianity. This created big, big, big problem for the Christian church. One would ask whether these important subjects were examined in details during the many sessions of the Nicene Synod. They did indeed study the matter in great details, but obviously, most of the discussion was fixated on the Arian controversy. God, Christ, is created, the Arian controversy. By the way, if some, some of you will ask, Jehovah's Witnesses, today's Jehovah's Witnesses, is a copy, exact copy of Arianism. Some of you might be surprised to hear this. 
But if, if you look at the history of Jehovah's Witnesses, how they started, uh, what was the early um, uh, thoughts of, uh, and teachings of, uh, uh, was it Armstrong or something? I forgot his name. Anyway, you will see exactly a copy of Arianism that there is two gods. God the great God and the small God. Christ is the small God who was created by the big great God. And it was just Arianism. If you want further details, please look at the history of Jehovah's Witnesses. It'll give you exactly a good picture of Arianism of the uh, third century. What if the Synod went further and comprehensively expounded on the statement of God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made of the same essence as the Father? Imagine if they sat for another two, three days or a week and interpreted this for us explained it, I personally think they would have saved the church many, many controversies and issues. But they didn't. Not because they didn't want to, but their, their thoughts were completely fixated on Arianism. That's the only thing they were uh, busy with. Asharam is not leaving me alone. Now, it would have laid the path for less disagreements and controversies within the Christian church in the years following the Nicene Creed. In this research that I did, it, it is about 50 pages that I've written. I'm not going to read it all to you tonight. Though. Don't be shocked. But in this, in this uh, uh, study, you will... We will investigate the background which led to the great controversy of the 5th century AD, known as the Nestorian controversy, and the reason for the division within the Western and Eastern Church into other churches, the Catholic, the Orthodox, the, the uh, Nestorian, the Coptic Church, this division that happened we will discuss all this, but obviously, briefly, I'm not going to go deep, deep into details because it's, you're talking about 14, 1500 years of uh, history. I will touch upon the fundamentals of the controversy and the areas of disagreement between Constantinople and Alexandria concerning the person of Jesus Christ, as well as the exchange of anathema between Cyril, Saint Cyril of the Coptic Church, he's a very famous person within the Coptic Church, and Nestorus, Saint Nestorus of Constantinople. It is important to note that the Greek language, this is where all the issues started. Ah, the Greeks. It is important to note that the Greek language was the main medium for exchange of philosophical and theological discourses during that period. It was the Greek language was the main language in the West. And even Egypt itself, because, you know, Egypt was um, main, some philosophical school, Greek early philosophical schools they founded in, in Alexandria. Most of the letters, dialogues, and treaties were mainly communicated in Greek. Since it was the main language used in many philosophical schools of the ancient pre-Christian era, the New Testament book itself was written in Koine, or Koine, Greek. You know that, right? It was written in Greek. 
Therefore, the Greek language became the language used to compose vast theological and exegetical uh, writing of the early church fathers. This contributed to discovery of the ne necessary vocabulary and pro proper terminologies to identify certain theological and Christological terms for addressing the issue of the person and nature of Christ. No other language could have explained some terminologies within the theological or Christological dialogue better than the Greek language because it is a vast, it is a rich language. Now, we're talking this in the West. What about in the East? What language was spread in the East? Was the Aramaic language. It was not Greek language. In Persia, in Iraq, in Bet Nahrin, Mesopotamia, Syria, they did not speak Greek language. They spoke Aramaic. Even the texts, the books, were letters. They all written in Aramaic. This is another problem. Now, these guys in the West, they use some Greek terminologies to discuss the person of Christ, while in the East, they will use Aramaic terminologies to discuss the person of Christ. And now, hence is the clashes, the misunderstanding between Greek and Aramaic language. We'll come to that probably in the second or third session, God willing. Furthermore, Greek philosophy played a greater role in influencing the thoughts and writing of the early church fathers. Most of the church fathers, they attended schools, philosophical schools. Obviously, they studied in Greek language, not in Aramaic, only those who are in the East. So, that's why suddenly you will see the influence of Greek philosophy slowly getting, slowly getting into the details of the Christian uh, understanding and Christian teachings. For instance, the Platonic and Aristotelian schools of thought were able to penetrate into Christianity by applying the above philosophical style of thinking, having their impression and influence felt in early church fathers' literature. In, in, in the Greek world, people used to go to school or parents used to send their kids to a school. That school, for instance, is known, they say, oh, this is a platonic oriented schools. It means they use Plato in the discussion of philosophy. Or he'll say, no, I'll send him to the other school. Or oh, the Aristotelian, Aristo, Aristotle, you're going to send your son over there, that the interpretation is all Aristotelian uh, touch in it. So there was people the world was divided into two sects, the Platonic thinking and the Aristotelian thinking. And this penetrated into the church again. Since the early foundation of Christianity, the church struggled with controversies, especially in the West. And why in the West? Because of the philosophical, Greek philosophical thoughts. Always there was controversies. If I list to you the number of people and thoughts and controversies uh, happened during, within the Roman Empire or the, within the West, it's just a huge number. Anyone who, who attended certain school, 
he became a teacher or he became a philosophical, he will take the Bible, he will take the New Testament and start interpreting and say, this is how I believe in Christ. And there you go, a controversy. Because he'll set up a school of his own and he'll, has, he'll have students and he'll have followers. So imagine, so many schools, so many controversies. Mostly originated from the West who had their influence spread to the East. Meanwhile, fewer controversies originated in the East, which I mean the domain of the Persian Empire, such as the controversy of Manichaeans and the Ebionites. Now, Manichaeans, which is uh, a person, Mani, his name was Mani, M-A-N-I, he he came up with this controversy. And the Ebionites. Ebionites, by the way, they were spread in, um, in the Arabia desert, Saudi Arabia currently. They were, they were Jewish sect, but mainly they were uh, living in that area. That's why you will see the stories about Christ in the Quran mainly based on Ebionite tradition. What is Ebionite? The Ebionites, they say Jesus is a mere mere man. He's just a prophet, just like many other, just like Muslims now, they call Jesus a prophet. They don't call him the son of God or any of the terms that we use because It was influenced by the Ebionite. And this is another subject, a really serious subject, uh, an important subject. I wish we have the chance to to talk about it, how the effect of uh, Ebionism or the Ebionites on the Islamic tradition or religion. In the East, the dominant language was Syriac, or what we called the Aramaic the one today we use in the liturgy here, but actually this is a modern, modern Syriac. The one I'm talking about is the, the older version uh, of, this, of the Aramaic or the Syriac, a language used mainly by the Syriac-speaking church. The reason I'm using the word Syriac because academically this language is called Syriac. They do not call it Aramaic because there's a difference between Syriac and Aramaic. Between timing, it's modern. Which one's modern, which one's more old? It was the common language of the region, spoken amongst the Jews and Syriac community, us and the Jews in Jerusalem. Followers of the early uh, Syriac Christian church of Edessa, You heard of Edessa. Edessa is a a city, mainly a Christian city, used to fall between the, exactly on the borders of the Persian Empire and the Roman Empire. One year, the Romans will occupy it for uh, 20 years, then the Persians will take over and occupy it. Um, Christians there, they get punished by both. By, Christian, by Roman Empire and the Persians. So they had a very bad luck of living in that city. Within the Persian Empire, the Church of the East was able to produce very sophisticated theological and Christological arguments using the Syriac language. Now remember, we got nothing to do with the West. This is our own. We have a philosophy, Christology of our own, which led to the development of a distinct theology of her own. The rise of early controversies in the East, coupled with influences of controversies of the West, drove the Eastern Church, which us, church fathers and churchmen, to produce arguments and literature recognized as being the highlights of their age. These include the writing of Afrahat, one of the great writers, Jacob of Nasibis, 
or Yaqud and Sivin, we call him. Ephraim the Syrian, or the Syriac, Mar Ephraim, Rabba, the one we, we have many of his uh, ayah here, uh, prayers. Narsay, Narsay the Great, Mar Narsay, Mar Bawai Rabba, and then Mar Awa the Great. These all known Eastern theologians. These controversies, especially the Nestorian one, had enriched the Eastern and Western Syriac dialogue. Now, when we say Eastern Syriac and Western Syriacs, probably some of you will say, what is the difference between the Eastern dialogue and the Western dialogue of the Syriac? Now, the Western dialogue is the one today that used by the Syrian Orthodox Church when they say, Qadisho Olaho, Qadisho Helthono, Qadisho Lo. The O, when you hear this O, it's the Western dialogue. But when you see Qadisha Alaha, Qadisha Helthana, Qadisha A, 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 it's us. So these two uh, uh, dialogue, the East and West uh, uh, Syriac. Adopting new vocabularies, we started to create a new vocabularies to, in, our, um, in our discussion. They improved both scripts, resulting in a clearer script and pronunciation near the end of the 6th century AD. On the other hand, it is unfortunate that some vital Syriac terms essential for for full comprehension of the Syriac or Eastern Church Christology, such as the word qnuma. Now, I want you to remember this word, qnuma. Qnuma created so much problems between the Church of the East and the West. The West understand it in one way, and we tried to make them, to explain it to them. They couldn't because they said, we don't have in our language this word qnuma in Greek. So they said, oh, you mean person. We said, no, no, it's not person. Person is you, you, you. Qnuma is something else. We tried to, exp and they couldn't, we couldn't explain it. And clashes of controversies between the two. We'll discuss that later again. Now, Qnuma was completely misunderstood by the Western Church. Hence, this would cause mis misperception in the real interpretation and true understanding of the Eastern theology. They could not understand us. We don't speak Greek. We speak Syriac. We could not explain our theology and their terminology while they explaining their Christology in their terminology, which we couldn't understand. So hence the problem between the two, especially when dealing with the matter of the person of Christ. The Church of the East, presently the Assyrian Church, existed outside the dominion of the Roman Empire. From, the, from her early foundation within the Persian Empire, she continued, regardless of the political situation and the threat of the being cons considered disloyal and agent of the West, to have a special relationship with the Church of Antioch. Salat, Seleucia, Ctesiphon, or let's call it Baghdad, presently, and Antioch, us and Antioch, we had a very good relationship. Even some of the, our consecration of bishops, we used to send them to Antioch to be consecrated there and come back to serve the church in Persia. From her early foundation within the Persian Empire, she continued regardless of the political situation and the threat of being considered disloyal and agent of the West to have a special relationship with Antioch. Do you know where Antioch is? In Turkey. Okay, look at the word Antioch. You'll find geographically where it's located. It was the city where Peter went to, took the gospel to Antioch. 
But the suspicion of disloyalty continued to haunt our church. History shows that on various occasions throughout her existence, the church has suffered indescribable persecutions by various Persian and Muslim rulers. For instance, look what happened. Look how misfortunate the Christians of the East were. When the Roman Empire became Christian, who brought Christian, who, what was the, the emperor who became first Christian emperor? Do you know? Constantine, right? Constantine, son of Helena, the one who, the one who found the cross in, Jer in Jerusalem. The, a letter was sent by Constantine to Shapur II, a Persian emperor. The Roman emperor sending a letter after Rome became Christian, he's sending a letter to the Persian em emperor, urging him, he's saying, would you please try to tolerate the Christian in your empire? Don't press them. Don't oppress them. Don't take over their properties. Don't persecute them. Uh, they are Christians. They are. So he spoke very highly of the Christian. And Shapur was reading this letter and saying, Aha, uh -huh. I have spies in my kingdom. These Christians... They must be very loyal to the, to the Roman emperor. All right, what do you think he's going to do? Shapur II. A week later, he started massacring Christians in his empire. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people, Christian, being killed by Shapur II. Just because of this letter. Until now, until now in the Middle East, this, this idea of, uh, of being very uh, cautious and nadariya to check the theory of, uh, of, sorry, conspiracy theory. The conspiracy theory in the Middle East runs wildly. Every time you say something, oh, you're supporting them, you're with them. You're a traitor. Exactly this is what happened. One letter from one emperor to the Persians caused thousands of people being murdered. The main reason for the absence of an effective representation of the Church of the East in the first ecumenical council at Nicaea in 325 was the ongoing unsettled relationship between the two empires. We couldn't send our delegation to Nicaea from the east. Only one person could attend, and he was a deacon because he lived in Edessa, and Edessa was under the rule of the Roman Empire. Who was that person? Saint Ephraim, Mar Ephraim. He was the only one could attend. How about if we talk a little bit about the Alexandrian school first of thought? Why? Because you need to understand what is this Alexandrian school, the church in Alexandria, how they used to interpret the Bible or the New Testament. Because this is good for you in understanding what's going to happen in the future between Nestorus and Cyril, the two great patriarchs. Now let's, let's briefly, the Alexandrian school was noted for its allegorical inter interpretation of scripture. What is that? It means they interpret the Bible, biblical narratives, as having a second level of references um, persons, events, things mentioned. For instance, if they read one 
verse in the Bible, they will look behind it of the event led to this. So, typical Platonic interpretations, because it was very, the school in Alexandria was very much affected by Plato's thoughts. So they take the verse and they start looking at having a second level of references. Not the original one, a second one. Beyond the person, beyond what is written there. They will look behind the sentence. It's just like you have, this is the face. I'm looking at the face. I'm not satisfied. I need to look at the back here. So this is how they used to deal in Alexandria with, uh, with interpretation of the, Testament, of the New Testament, which mainly leaned towards Hellenic philosophy, especially Platonism. Therefore, it focused only on the unity of the human and divine natures of Christ. This is now... We are going into the real stuff, huh? The natures, person, human, and divine natures. So these guys, what they happened, they looked at Christ, they looked at the interpret, they looked at verses, and they started dissecting. Oh, he means here that he is, he's, his nature is divine, while here his nature is human. There is a human nature and divine natures in Christ, too. But how these do communicate with each other, the divine nature and the uh, human nature. Both Alexandria and Antioch continue to struggle in finding and developing their own distinguished views and interpretation concerning the question of the relationship between the divine and human natures of Christ. Okay, let me stop here because I know most of you now you're going, huh? What? What are you talking about? I need to briefly explain what is the human and the divine nature. Now, if you look at the New Testament, if you look at 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24, you will read this. This is Paul saying, But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. What is this? What is he's the power of God and he's the wisdom of God? All of you sitting here, you will say, oh, he was wise and he was powerful, Christ. But wait a minute. He's saying is, is. He did not say he became. He said, is the power, is the wisdom of God. I'll explain it to you very in a very simple terms. In God's wisdom, in God's wisdom, there was the Messiah, Christ, in God's wisdom. That's why Paul said, Christ is the wisdom of God. So just like I look into you, and I know you have something in your mind. Each individual sitting here, he's got so many things going on in your mind. But there is one important thing, probably, you always hope that one day will happen. I don't know what it is. You know. So God, in his wisdom, from, 
I can't use the word from the beginning. By the way, we Syriac tradition, we the Aramaic tradition, we do not say in the beginning. We say brashit, just like the Jews, brashit. It means when there was no beginning. There's no... When you say in the beginning, it means God, you're giving God a beginning, correct? But we used brashit. When there was no time, when there was no beginning. So God, in his wisdom, there was this thing called the Messiah. What is the Messiah, by the way? Anyone, have, have you ever interpreted the word Messiah? Yes, Messiah, it, it's, it's someone who is anointed by the Holy Spirit. That's why the word Mshicha is more clearly set to interpret the word Messiah. Mshicha, okay, if I take this glass and I anoint it with Oil in Syriac, what, if I, what would I say? I would say, a glass, mshichele, mshicha, mshicha. See, mshicha, it's anointed, it's oiled. So, in God's wisdom, there was this the Messiah who was the Word. Who talked about the Word, by the way? Someone in the, in the New Testament mentioned something about the word. Anyone knows? John. Come on. John. John first, chapter 1, verse 1. Look, I read it. I remind you of it. It's very important. This, is, this verse is set the foundation of Christianity. It is the foundation of Christianity. John chapter 1, verse 1. Let me read it to you. Although it says, in the beginning. Let's, let's read it. In the beginning, beginning was the Word. What is the Word? What is the Word? Who can, who can name this Word? In the beginning, there was Christ, Messiah. And the Word was with God, as I said to you, in the wisdom of God. And Christ was with God. And the Word was God. Anything in your mind belongs to you. Personally, correct? Does not belong, belong to no one else. Anything you own, it's owned by you. So if you have something in your mind, does it, is it owned by someone else? It's not sitting in some other people's brains. It's sitting in your own brain, here in your own mind. So that's why the word was God, because it was with God. That's why Christians said, Christ is God. But how? Look. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him. Wisdom of God. Remember Paul? Because God through his wisdom created everything, correct? That's how we understand Christianity. All things came into being through him. And without him, not one thing came into being. Without God, nothing would have happened. He said, let it be light. If he did not say this, there was no light. Let us create human being, Barnasha. Who is let? Why, why he said let us? Why, he, why God didn't say, 
I am going to create a human being. He said, let us. Who are us? Aha. Uh -huh. His wisdom, Bruna, Christ, and the Holy Spirit. That's why Christianity, they say, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. This is simply interpreting this uh, issue. Now, God, the creator, looked at humanity. He said, hmm, what should I do with these people? I sent so many prophets. I sent so many good people to teach them, to bring them back to me. They keep sinning. And they keep doing things not in accordance with my own will. You know what I will do? I will go down myself. That's the best solution. This is what God said. But wait a minute. God is a spirit. The fathers of the church, St. Paul, all they say, the, the God is a shining sun that no human being can look at. His glory is so huge that we human beings cannot comprehend. So God, how am I going to do that? I'm talking very as a human being, not as a God. Huh? God, he wouldn't say these, what should I do? Because he knows what to do. What he's going to do, what is in his mind? Remember, I said it earlier, the word. Christ, he said, Christ will go down. But wait a minute, Christ is, a, is the spirit. He needs to take a human body on him. How he's going to do that? He sent Gabriel, angel Gabriel. He said to Mary, blessed are thou, Oh, thou Mary. Immediately when he said, Shlamalach, peace be with you, that second, that moment, Mary became pregnant. Because the word, the wisdom of God, through the power of God, the Holy Spirit, Mary became pregnant. Now the word, wisdom of God, took flesh from Mary. When she bore the child, we looked at him, they said, we'll call him Esau, Emmanuel. But that child, he's a fully human, right? Because he became from Mary, just like your children, fully human. From, but at the same time, he is God. Because God dwell there. God took upon himself the code of humanity. That's why our father said, our early fathers said, they said, Jesus Christ has two natures, a human nature and a divine nature. That human nature took it from Mary. That divine nature was from the Father. So now we understand why we say Christ has two natures. Fully man, fully human. Is it clear? Or you're still struggling? You're not struggling. Good. See, the, see on, on one of the... I was sitting somewhere. Some, some people asked me some questions. Not everyone... Not everybody that went to high school or engineering, BA or science, can talk about theology and Christology. You need to go train your mind to be a philosophical mind in order to understand all this. You can't be a bank teller or 
an electrician, and suddenly you become an interpreter <laughs> of the New Testament. You need to go and study. You need to prepare your mind to become philosophical mind in order to understand this, because you might make, make some huge mistakes when you talk about Christianity. So now, we reach into a conclusion of one hour, correct? But we reached a point, very important point, which was very good for our second session. In the second session, we will discuss the Antiochian school, how they used to interpret the Bible. Then, we will talk about the person of Cyril, who talked about one nature, one Qnuma hypostasis, we'll talk about that later too, and Nasturus who taught about two natures and two Qnumi and one Parsupa, we'll discuss that also. But now I want you to go home in the understanding that now I understand why we say Christ is fully man and fully, fully human and fully divine. We, I understood that when I say fully divine, it means he was born from St. Mary. Fully divine because he came down. The word, the word came down through the Holy Spirit, united itself with the human body that took from Mary, and they became what? One person. Every time we looked at him, we saw him uh, just a normal human being walking, wearing sandals and walking through the, the, the roads of Judea and Jerusalem. But hang on a minute. Suddenly, I'll let you go with this. He was... He was leaning, taking a nap in a boat. And suddenly, the sea went wild. Waves and wind and storms. The boat was going 20 meter up in the air and down. And he was still as if there is nothing. These apostles are scared to death. Imagine you're sitting in a small boat and the, and the waves are taking you 20 meters up and down. They got really scared. They went to him. They said, Lord, Lord, Rabbi, Rabbi, we're perishing. We're dying. He looked at them. He said, oh, how many times I'll be with you? You have no faith. He stood up. What, he, what did he do? He just pointed at the sea, said, quiet. Suddenly, all the 20 meters waves came down to a very peaceful sea. No winds, nothing. Who has this power over nature? Only God has power over nature. On another occasion, they came to him and they said, your friend Laza, Lazarus passed away. He's dead. He felt compassion and he cried. God cries? human, his human nature felt the effect of love and compassion and sadness and happiness and being weak and being hungry, being thirsty through his human nature that he took from Mary. See the difference now? But both these are united. It is important to understand this unity 
does not ha have a mixture. They are not mixed like ink and water. You mix them and then you cannot tell which one is ink, which one is water. Both natures are united in a perfect unity with no mixture, with no commingling. Each nature preserves its own characteristic in its the word now the Assyrians use, pnuma. It means the underlying characteristics of the nature. I'll explain that to you. I will make it so simple. I'll try to be so simple in order that you say, thank God we understood it. But please, some of the terminologies that I gave you today, I want you to go and look into it, into Uncle Google. It'll help you a lot.